Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar this morning. Um, we are just going to give it another few seconds to let everyone um, join and then we will kick off the session. Right, I think that should be enough time for everyone to join. Um, so hi everyone, welcome to today's Print 2 7 in 30 minutes webinar. My name is Gemma and I'm the Content Marketing Manager at ILX. Um, apologies for those who joined us on Tuesday. We had a bit of a technical issue, um, but we're back on the sort of the older version of the platform. So I'm hoping there should be absolutely no issues today. Um, before I hand over to Karen Swanson, our Senior Training Consultant, I just need to run through a few housekeeping bits. So as you'll all see, You've all uh, joined in, in mute, on mute, and please can remain on mute throughout the session. If you do have any questions, though, about sort of technical questions, we'll answer them live. But any other questions, please feel free to put them to the panel, the, the panel on the side, and um, we will answer them at the end in the Q and A. We are recording today's session, um, so you will receive a follow up email from us tomorrow with the link, so you can watch it back or forward on to colleagues. Um, also, we're very active on social media, so we'd love it if you could just give us a follow, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram are our primary channels. Um, and as said, there will be a, a Q&A at the end um, after the session finishes, which is about 30 minutes. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over to you, Karen. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm Karen Swanston um, and I've been a, a trainer um, teaching Prince 2 since 2008. Um, I've also been involved in the updates to Prince 2 for the last two versions. Um, so the version that we are looking at today is going to be Prince 2 7, which is the newest version, which only came out in September 23. Um, so um, there is a different webinar that's been recorded that looks at the differences from the previous version to Prince 27, but we are purely just focused on Prince 27 today. Um, so what we're going to be covering today is we're going to have a look at how easy it can be to learn Prints 2. And to do that, we're going to have a look at some of the basics of the framework without overcomplicating it. And also, I'm going to provide you with some quick and easy um, helpful hints and tips. Um, once we've looked at that, we'll then have a look at the different exams that's available for PRINS2 um, and what type of training courses are available as well. And then, as Gemma said, we'll finish off with some questions at the end. So as you go through, if you, if, as we go through the session, if you're thinking of any questions, make a note of them and then we'll try to get through as many as we can towards the end of it. OK, um, so let's get started. Um, so we're going to start off by having a look at the definition of a PRINCE2 project. So a project is a temporary organization that's created for the purpose of delivering one or more business product according to an agreed business case. Now, there's a lot of important information in there, but one that I want to really focus on is the fact that the project is temporary. So once the project has produced the products that it needs to do, then the products will be handed over into the business for the users to use. So once the project has delivered what it needs to do, the project closes down and it's business as usual that can then picks up and carries on and uses those products. So to look at that a little bit further, um, I want to have a look here. We've got a bit of a background about projects in comparison to business as usual. And as we've just seen, a project is there to produce a product. What that product is could be lots of different things. It might be a new IT system. It could be some updated procedures. But every project is new and different. And every project is creating special products, new and unique products. So Prince 2 refers to the products as specialist products. At the end of the day, the project is producing some stuff. Once the project has produced the products, it hands it over into the business for people to use. Now, the people that will use the products are referred to as the users. So the specialist products are very much an output from the project. And when the users start to use the new products, things in business as usual will start to change. Now, that change is what's referred to as an outcome. 
And with any sort of change, there are two sides to the change. There's a positive side, there's a negative side. The positive part of the change is what's referred to as a benefit. So a measurable improvement for one or more stakeholder. The negative side is referred to as a disbenefit. So when we're looking as to whether we should go ahead with a project, we need to look at the big picture of this and think about, well, what is the investment that's needed in the project? How and when will that bring about the change within the business to deliver those benefits? So do we have the justification for um, doing and going ahead with this project? Now, the terminology of outputs and outcomes Sometimes there's things that you can do really easily to remember things like this. So here I've highlighted the P in output to link into products and the C in outcome because the outcome is all about a change. And it's little things like that that actually helps us to remember things and it makes it a lot easier for us to learn. Now, PRINCE2 is made up of five integrated elements. We have principles, practices, processes, the project environment and people. Now the principles, these are the guiding obligations which are kind of like the underlying rules that must all be applied for it to be a print to project. Now once we've learned the principles, they then are really like second nature. They're things that we would automatically do. And without the principles, it would probably feel a little bit weird. Now to try to explain this in maybe a non-business kind of way, if we think about preparing a meal, if you are preparing a meal, one of the things that you'll need to do is wash your hands before you start touching any of the food. Now, that is something that you will have learned at some point of your, in your life, and now it would just be automatically done. So that's like the principles. Once you've learned them, you automatically do them, often without even realizing. Now, the practices, the practices are, are kind of like subject areas for project management. And we have seven practices and all of these practices are addressed all the way through the project. But some of the practices are needed at the same time of each other's. So thinking about that as part of preparing a meal, if we are making, for example, a cottage pie, we will need lots of different ingredients to come together to make that end product but the ingredients will be using some ingredients alongside other ingredients. The ingredients are just like the practices. You're gonna need them all the way through producing that cottage pie, but some will be used at the same time. So we might be cooking the potatoes as we're cooking the base for the cottage pie. But also those ingredients are going to evolve and change as we go through the project. So the potatoes will look very different at the beginning of the project to the end of the, of the cooked cottage pie. Practices in Prince 2 will evolve and change as we go through again. Now coming down to the processes. The processes is a stepwise progression through the project from getting started to project closure. But each of the seven processes is actually made up of a number of activities, a number of steps inside there. Now, those processes tell you exactly what to do with the project. Now, if we had never made a cottage pie before, we might look towards a recipe to give us the guidance, to give us that step by step of what to do. But the recipe tells you what to do with the ingredients at that point in the recipe, at that point in the project. But the recipe will not tell you to wash your hands because that's a principle, that's an underlying rule. Now, thinking about the project context, this is where PRINCE2 is thinking about how flexible PRINCE2 needs to be. The project environment itself can come in lots of different shapes and sizes. And we need to make sure that how we are managing the project is in the best way for that particular environment. So if we're thinking about producing a cottage pie, is that cottage pie a, a microwave meal, a, a cottage pie for one? Is it a family cottage pie? Is it a manufacturing company who's creating cottage pies? The environment can be very different. And therefore, how we are going to manage that might be very different. But also, 
often we might have slight tweaks to the recipe so you might add your own special ingredient in there on here i've put are we including carrots yeah are we having cheese on the top so it's about how we are tweaking and amending the prince 2 method to make it appropriate for our own environment but remember all of the principles must be applied there's no messing about with the principles now right down at the bottom we've then got people you cannot possibly manage a project and produce products without people involved you can see there on the diagram at the left hand side that people is very much in the center of prince too so when we're thinking about producing a cottage pie producing a meal has that person oops, sorry has that person those people involved got the right skills to create that end product have they had the training do they need some support um, how can we motivate people to participate with this also what about the relationships with other people involved in the project is there just one person in the kitchen doing everything or is one person doing one thing and then it's being passed on to somebody else to do the next thing so we need to make sure we understand these relationships and we understand how we can support people to actually work in, on the project to produce the products now, some of these we're going to have a look uh, at a little bit closer. First of all, the principles. So they're all listed down here. The first one, ensure continued business justification. Now, we need to make sure that the investment in the project is justified for the business. And we would do that at the beginning of the project. But as we go through the project, things evolve and change. So at key points, we would update the business case, which is documenting the justification, to see whether we've still got a viable project to continue with. Learn from experience, does what it says on the tin, really. Learn from what other people have done, but also think about how our, how our own experiences we can pass on for other people to learn from. Define roles, responsibilities, and relationships very much coming back to that people element so we need to make sure that all the different roles and responsibilities on the project are assigned to people they understand what they are but also they understand how that connects to other people on the project manage by stages rather than looking at the project as one big chunk we're going to break it down to be more manageable as a minimum we'd have at least two stages the first stage to plan what we're going to do which we refer to as the initiation stage then the second stage would be to do everything and close it down but that second stage we can break down further if it makes it more manageable for that project manage by exception is about the delegation downwards um, within the project so we've got different management levels and we have the work and the targets delegated down on the understanding that if there's any problems with those targets that that is escalated back upwards immediately focus on products is about making sure we understand well what is the end product that we're trying to achieve and also what are all the other products that's needed to deliver that end product and the final principle tailor to suit the project every project is unique and different just thinking about number of stages that's one part of tailoring the project but also the language the terminology that's used within your own organization people might be familiar with slightly different terminology so think about how that could be used within the prince 2 method so prince 2 needs to be tailored so it's more suitable for that environment now there's the seven principles we also have seven practices this is the different subject areas for, for project management so we're going to have a look at all of these as part of um part of this session so we're going to have a look at business case organizing plans quality risk issues and progress or we're going to touch on some elements of them now all of those practices are used throughout our processes and the processes, seven processes again, are these shaded boxes. Now up at the top of the processes, we've got this red arrow of commissioning the business layer. And this is the people who are instigating the project. These are the people who are giving out the mandate. Now the mandate could be a formal official document. 
but quite often it might be a verbal request coming out of a meeting. But the mandate is whatever you have received that makes you to start thinking about the project. And the mandate is the trigger to come into the first process of starting up a project. So let's have a look at the activities that we do in starting up a project. Now each of those blue boxes are activities, things that need to be done. The green box at the top, the project mandate, is the trigger to come into this. And the first activity we have is to appoint the executive and project manager. The executive is a person in charge. They're in charge of the project board and they will delegate down to project manager the day-to-day -day responsibilities of running the project. So it's, it's logical that the executive and project manager are the first people that's appointed. We then come down and assess previous lessons. Now this is supporting the principal learn from experience. The bottom left hand side, we've got prepare the outline business case. It's the first version of the business case to look at whether we've got the justification to go and do this project. At the right hand side, we start looking at the project management team. We're gonna look at that more in a moment. Select the project approach. How are we gonna deliver the project? Can we do it in-house ourselves, purely just upgrading something we've already got? Or do we need to outsource it? Do we need to have brand new things implemented and designed for the organisation? Now, all of this information that we're coming together in Start Up A Project is coming into the project brief. So the project brief is like a folder that holds all that information together. And that is needed to show that there is um, the justification that this idea for this project looks like it's viable, it looks like it's a good idea. But the final step that we do is to create a plan for the initiation stage. Now, that plan for the initiation stage this is where we're going to create the project plan, where we're going to plan the project in more detail. So here we're going to create the first of our plans. So from starting up a project, we've looked at a few practices, one of which is the organising practice. Now, over at the right hand side, we've got that word in a project management team with the first letters highlighted there in red. Now, at starting up a project, we define who is on the project management team. But the fact that I've highlighted those first letters means that the project management team is often abbreviated into PMT. Now, this is, can be really helpful. Because the project management team is actually made up of three levels of management. We have the project board directing the project, the project manager managing the project, and we have the team manager looking after the delivering level, delivering the specialist products. Now, project management team PMT has got three letters in there, and there are three levels of management. Something like that can make it easy to learn. Now, up at the top, we've got the commission in the business layer. Now, they're not part of the project management team, but they are part of the temporary organisation structure. So that PMT can really help us to remember which levels are actually part of the project management team. Now, as well as the organising practice, we also had a look in Startup Project at the business case practice because we create the outline business case. Now, as we progress through our project, as we move into the initiation stage, we will then update that into a full detailed business case, which needs to justify then the delivery of the project. But as we move th forward in the project and we come towards the end of each stage, we will then update the business case to see if we've still got that continued business justification. Now, up at the top of the diagram, we've also got this, this wording about confirming benefits. Now, benefits will be achieved once the users have started to use the new products. So for some projects, that will not be seen until after the project's closed, until post-project. So it might be sometime in the future once those benefits can be seen. But for other projects, you might see benefits right at the end of the, the project itself, at the end of the final stage. But depending on the, the type of delivery we're doing on the project, if we do a phased implementation, we might see some benefits even at the end of a stage. 
So the business case is evolving as we go through the project. So from starting up a project, the key outputs there is the project brief, which is the documentation, uh, bringing all of this together, and the plan for the initiation stage. And we need to take that to the next process, directing a project. Now, directing a project is where the project board make all of their decisions. So the first decision that they are making is to decide whether to allow you to go into initiation. So if they authorize initiation, that will then allow us to go into the next process, initiating a project. So let's go and have a look at that one. Now, initiating a project, again, is made up of a number of different blue activities here. The first one is about agree the tailoring requirements, but then agree the management approaches. Now, we have a number of different management approaches. We have nine altogether, and these are just describing procedures. So the first management approach there is the change management approach. So thinking about, well, what is the current state in the organization regarding policies, practices, ways of working? And what's the target state that we want in, uh, to take the organization to? And how is that transition going to work? We have the communication management approach. Communication on the project is really important. And this will be documenting not only the internal communication on the project, but also the external communication that's needed as well. Sustainability management approaches. Now, the project is creating new and different things for the organization. And therefore, it's a perfect opportunity to bring in new ways of working that's more sustainable, thinking about your organization's targets for sustainability. Benefits management approach, looking at when and how benefits can be measured. Commercial management approach, the people working on your project, sometimes you might be linking to external suppliers or partners, and it's understanding how those commercial contract arrangements need to work as part of the project. Quality management approach, how are we going to achieve quality? Not just about the specialist products, but also thinking about the ways of working as well. Risk management, the procedures of identifying risks, assessing risks. Issue management is going to be describing not only about how to deal with problems and concerns and things, but also how to deal with requests for changes. And the final one, the digital and data management approaches, is thinking about the use of technology, the data that we have. How can we best use that to help the project? So we agree all of these different management approaches, and then we come down and we prepare the project plan. Now, the project plan is the high level view of everything we're going to do on the project and built into the project plan will be project controls. So some things of project controls might be about having stage boundaries to make it more manageable. It can also be how often we're going to be reporting on progress. Now, once that project plan has been created, we'll have the estimates for the timescales and the costings, and that can then come down and feed into the business case. So we can now prepare the full detailed business case. Now, all of this information then comes together and is assembled as part of the project initiation documentation, the PID. Now, on here, again, a number of practices have been looked at. One of the practices is risk. So let's have a little bit of a, a look at the risk practice. So here we've got a definition of a risk. So a risk is something that's uncertain. So an uncertain event or set of events, should it occur, will affect the achievement of objectives. Now, if the risk is something that's uncertain, words to look out for for that uncertainty would be may, might, could. So risk is something that may happen, it might happen, it could happen. Now, if the risk is something that's uncertain, that uncertainty could be a negative threat, but it could also be a positive opportunity. So if a risk is something that's uncertain, in comparison to that, let's have a look at an issue. So an issue is something that has happened or it will happen. It's not planned. There's no uncertainty with an issue. So the definition there on the left hand side, an issue is an event relevant to the project. 
it requires management consideration. It is something that's happened. We need to look at that. Whereas a risk is something that may happen in the future. Now, just picking up on these words, this subtle difference of words can help to see the difference between a risk and an issue. So a risk is something that may happen. An issue is something that has happened or it will happen. So as well as the risk and the issue practice, we also mentioned the quality practice there as well. Now, as part of the quality practice, we need to understand what the end product is that we're trying to deliver. And we would create a project product description. Now, the project product description will be describing what the user's quality expectations are. So here we've got an example that the users are wanting a fast, new, flashy car. Now, to go alongside those expectations, we need the acceptance criteria that is taking it to a measurable definition. So rather than just saying a fast car, it's defining that it needs to do naught to 60 in three seconds. So we now know what will be acceptable. Now we'd have one project product description describing the project's product, but we would also have a number of individual product descriptions describing the component products. So for example, the electric charge unit, the tires, the seats would all need their own description. Now, as well as the quality practice, we also touched on the plans practice because in initiating a project, we create the project plan. Now, the project plan is the high level view of everything that we're going to do on the project. We're identifying what the major products are and we're writing product descriptions. We're also thinking about the estimates for the time scales and costings, which will give us an overall time and cost for delivering the project. Now, once we put the project plan together, we can also think about, do we need to break this down into smaller stages for it to be more manageable? So from initiating a project, that project plan and the business case is going to go inside the PID along with all the approaches. Up to the project board in directing a project, asking them to authorize the project. But before we go to the project board, with the PID. First of all, we would nip across into managing a stage boundary. And in managing a stage boundary, we're then going to create the stage plan, the next stage plan. Now, the stage plan can take direction from the project plan as far as the major products in the project plan, but breaking it down into more detail. We'd write product descriptions for the products, we'd do the estimates for time scales and costs. So then we've got an understanding of the time and cost for doing all of that work in that stage. This is going to be more accurate because we're looking at it in more detail. So now we've got the stage plan. We can go up to the project board directing a project. We can present the PID in authorise the project. And then we can present the next stage plan into authorise a stage or an exception plan. Now, if the project board approves all of this, then we come down into control in a state stage. You roll your sleeves up, you get on with it. That stage plan that we've created, we're now going to look at that to see, well, what are we needing to do? So in that stage plan from control in a stage, we're going to be giving out work packages to the teams in managing product delivery. As part of the team doing the work in managing product delivery, they're going to send regular progress reports back to project manager. So when the team manager receives that work package, they can then create a team plan to explain how all of that work can be done within their, within their teams. So the progress updates that needs to be done from the team manager will have checkpoint reports going up to the project manager. From the project manager in control on the stage, we'll have progress updates going up to directing a project. Now that tip brings us in to the progress practice. The progress practice looks at a number of things, one of which is the reporting that's needed. So as we've just seen from the team manager, we'll have regular checkpoint reports going up to project manager. From project manager, we'll have regular highlight reports going up to the project board. Now the project board, specifically the executive, needs to keep that commissioning business layer up to date and they'll send regular project status reports. Now, the checkpoint highlight, the project status reports, these are all time driven. 
which means they are created because it's that day of the week or it's the first Tuesday of the month, whatever it may be. Now, those reports are purely just describing progress. They're not describing problems that might be happening. If we have problems, we need to look at those in a slightly different way. Now, one other aspect of the progress practice is also the consideration of tolerances. So tolerances is the permissible deviation around our target. It's how much wiggle room do we have? Now, we would definitely have tolerances set for time and cost, but we could also have tolerances set for benefits, quality, scope, sustainability and risk. And tolerances get delegated downwards between the different management levels. And if there is any problems with those tolerances, that needs to be escalated back up between those management levels. So not only are we escalating up the regular progress reporting, if there's any problems, we would escalate that up immediately. We wouldn't wait until the next report's been sent. So coming back to our processes then. So in control in the stage, we've been getting update reports from the team manager. And when we are updating the stage plan, as we are coming towards the end of one stage, that's the trigger to come into managing a stage boundary to plan the next stage. But in managing a stage boundary, we would also update the project plan, the business case and create an end stage report. And all of that is going to help the project board in directing a project decide whether to authorise you to go into that next stage. If the project board says yes, then we're back into control in the stage, giving out work packages to the team manager in managing product delivery, getting checkpoint reports back, updating the stage plan and so on. And depending on how many stages we have in the project, these highlighted processes would need to happen a number of times. As we're working on the final stage, we're in control in the stage, getting updates from the team manager. But as we are forecasting, we're coming towards the end of the final stage, that is the trigger to come across into closing a project, to, to confirm that the project has delivered everything it needs to do. We would evaluate the project, create an end project report, look at the lessons that we can learn to pass on to other people. Think about the communication that needs to be sent out and all the documentation will then get archived away. Now, from closing a project, we then need to hand that over to the project board in direction of project to formally authorise the closure. So that is the point where the project is then officially closed. So there we've had a look at our processes and we've touched into the practices that are used along the way as well. So what I wanted us to do is to have a look at the basics of the framework and some helpful hints and tips. So what we're going to move on to do now is have a little bit of a look at the exams for PRINCE 2 and the courses that's available and then get ready with your questions. So as far as the exams are concerned, there are two levels of exams. Both of them are multiple choices. The foundation exam, there are 60 multiple choices. It, we have a 60 minute time frame and the pass mark is also 60%. So we need to get 36 correct answers out of the 60 to pass. Now for the foundation exam, you cannot take any materials into the foundation exam with you. Whereas when we come to the practitioner exam, the practitioner exam is still a multiple choice exam. However, you can take into the exam your PRINCE2 manual or you can have open your ebook and um, your PRINCE2 ebook instead. Now, the practitioner exam is made up of 70 questions. We've got 150 minutes. The pass mark is still 60 percent, which works out of 42 out of 70. But the practitioner exam uses a scenario. There'll only be one scenario in the exam, but actually in your PRINCE2 manual or your ebook, there are four scenarios that have been described within the manual itself. And it will be one of those scenarios that is then used in your exam. Now, as far as learning PRINCE2, there are different ways of learning. There is the traditional way, face-to-face -face of classrooms. We also have virtual learning that can be really interactive. There's online where you can use e-learning and do some self-studying. Now, when it comes to Blended, 
if you imagine all three of those, we can mix and match all of this together and do it in a different way. So if you want to know more about the training courses that's available on the bottom of the screen there, we've got the, um, the website link, which will tell you about all the different training courses that's available. So it's at this point, we're then going to move on to have a look at any questions that you might have. Now, if I could ask you to keep the questions focused on PRINCE2, PRINCE27, um, that would be brilliant. So let me go back to Gemma and have a look at some of the questions that have been coming through. Okay, bear with me. Okay, Gemma, so have we had some, many questions come through? Uh, not at the moment, Karen. I think you've done such an amazing job, it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we will we will stick around for, for a few minutes. If anybody does have any questions, then feel free to pop them in the chat box. They're often like buses, these questions. Okay, you wait for ages and then they all come at once. Okay. So we have had just one quick question about um so there will be a, an email being sent out with the recording tomorrow. So for anyone who wants to watch back, it'll be on our YouTube channel. Okay, thanks. One of the other things that I'll mention here as well, I mentioned it at the beginning, um, but what we've looked at there today is the new version of PRINCE2, PRINCE27. There is also another webinar that has been looking at the differences from the previous version to this version. So if, you, if you've been familiar with PRINCE2 in the past and want to look at the differences, it might be worth having a look at that other webinar. Okay. Um, so the first question that's come through is, which do you re recommend to be begin with, foundation? Absolutely. Um, so as part of the learning, the foundation um, course, the foundation training linking into the foundation exam, that covers very much the, the theory of PRINCE2. We're, we're looking at all of the different elements of PRINCE2 in a lot of detail. And the foundation exam is actually a prerequisite for you to be able to take and sit the practitioner exam. Technically, you can attend practitioner learning, uh, but to actually sit the practitioner exam, then the foundation is one of the prerequisites. There are other prerequisites um, that, um, so if you've got other qualifications, that can also work as a prerequisite for practitioner, but the foundation is definitely the route that I would suggest. Yeah. Um, now then, let's have a look at some of these other questions that's coming through. Um, do, do, do. Is foundation valuable on its own? Yes, absolutely. If out of the two different levels, it's actually the foundation part where you learn, I would say, 95, 98, 99% of PRINCE2. That's where the main learning is done. When you take it onto the practitioner level, it's taking that learning and it's kind of like looking at it backwards and forwards and inside out and so on. And it's looking at, at it in a more of a situational context. So in this situation, what would you do? So it's seen about how you would apply it more. So at the practitioner level um, is, is um, uh, really important, but foundation on its own is where you will actually do the majority of learning. Um, we've got a question about a project charter. Um, it's not some th terminology that I'm familiar with that. So who put the question in about the project charter? If you want to just come back to us on that one and explain what, what it is that you mean in there. Um, what else have we got? Once you have passed foundation and practitioner, do you need to resit further exams yearly? Now, at the moment, foundation, once you've passed foundation, you've passed it. Practitioner, to keep the practitioner status you do need to resit the exam every three years. Or um, Axelos and People, so People Cert is the exam board, um, they also have um, other mechanisms that if you are doing other qualifications, that, that will go towards um, your um, up, um, or your um, reapproval really of practitioner. So there's different ways of attaining that practitioner level. So it's not yearly. Um, it is every three years, but there are other ways of doing it as well. Yeah. So what else we're doing? Um, found difficulties, the Prince is the Prince if you have no project management experience from an older student who hasn't done any studying for a while, can totally relate to that one. Okay, now, in all honesty, I would say it depends on how you are learning. If you are sat there reading the book, it's not the most easy to understand if you've not got the experience. 
But if you actually attend one of the training courses with a real person, so such as the classroom or the virtual like is the area I would suggest, the trainers generally bring it alive. My example today about a cottage pie, I'm sure that's something you can probably relate to. Um, when we start talking about uh, creating things like product breakdown structures and things that we've not talked about today, I refer to it as being a shopping list. Um, on my course that I did yesterday, we talked about creating a Sunday lunch and asking, well, what are the major products that we'd have on a Sunday lunch? We have stories and examples to make it relevant because it's very much, if I believe that if we learn it in a really simple way like that, then we can understand the concept and then we can look at it in a much more complex manner uh, later. But learning it one step at a time is definitely the way. So, so what I would say to you is, um, if you are concerned about that, I would suggest to do um, the training where you have got a trainer actually unpicking things a little bit more. Yeah. Um, what else have we got on here? Um, okay, so construction manager, one uh, specialising in railway signalling um, on site, wanting to move into project management. Should you start with foundation? Yes. Um, the two levels it is definitely a level one and then a level two so it is kind of like a stepping block so you do need to do your foundation first um and your foundation is is open there for lots of different people it's not purely just focused on around people who are project managers and having the title of a project manager it's also helpful for people working within projects or working alongside projects to understand how they work and what terminology is used but but yeah i definitely encourage you to to have a go at the foundation level first um, if you already have foundation from a previous version do you need to do it again no you don't um, if you've got um, the um, sixth edition, so the previous version of foundation, you can use that to move on to practitioner. However, there are differences between them. Um, so as people, we all learn in different ways. Um, and um, so one of the things you can do is you can attend foundation training so that you've got that learning of the new version um, or you might want to do some self-studying yourself on the new version look at the comparisons there but technically you can go straight to practitioner but it will you will you do need to kind of address that there are some differences between them um, but um, but you don't technically need to do the foundation exam again but thinking about the learning to get that um, step up with the new terminology would be uh, something to consider. Yeah. Um, what is the benefit of classroom uh, versus twelve um, versus twelve months? Is it possible to do in one week? What are the key challenges for doing it in classroom style? Now, as a Prince Two trainer, I am biased here. There's no point in pretending otherwise. I am biased here. I think it is much better to learn in a classroom or on a virtual delivery. Blended learning is, not blended, sorry, um, online learning, doing e-learning, having 12 month access to the e-learning to do your exams is great because it gives you all that flexibility to fit it in between work and do a bit of learning here and a bit of learning there. But human nature is when we can do it whenever we want, we kind of push it back and we push it back and we push it back. Um, so you kind of have to be, be very disciplined to do that yourself. Um, but doing it in one group, um, either virtually or in a classroom, um, it's amazing how, because you're focused on it for, for the day, for example, or for the three days for foundation, then the two days for practitioner, because you're focusing on it and it's kind of all encompassing, it's amazing how it can be really good to learn. There are different ways of doing training because everybody is different. We all have different styles. I am 100% biased because I'm a trainer. I'm bound to be biased. Yeah. Uh, what else have we got? Um, how long does the course take? Foundation practice. I think I've possibly just mentioned that. Your foundation course in a virtual or a classroom will be a three day course. Um, your practitioner would be a two day course. Um, if you are doing the online learning, then you do have that flexibility that you can do the learning when it's relevant for yourself. 
Um, you've got a valid PRINCE2 practitioner certificate. How do you get accredited for PRINCE27? Well, basically, you take the practitioner exam under PRINCE27. Um, so you, even though you've got a valid practitioner uh, now based on, on uh, the sixth edition, or what you call 2017 edition, to actually get a certificate for seven, you would need to take that exam at the, using the, the PRINCE27 um, uh, exam. Um, what else have we got? Is it okay to have both PRINCE2 qualifications and PMP qualifications, or either one is just fine? Which is your recommendation? Now, the, they are very similar. They have a lot of overlap as far as the subjects and things. Um, I personally like both of them for different reasons. I think PRINCE2 is fantastic because it gives you that structure. It's kind of like the, the foundations of, of how projects work. It gives you that structure with the processors and it's really clearly defined. One of the benefits of PMP is PMP takes the practices a little bit further. So when we've got the plans practice in PRINCE2 and it talks about project plans and stage plans and things, um, it, it will say you can create your plan how you want. It gives you some techniques. But in project management, in the PMP qualification, then it takes the practices maybe to a slightly deeper level. So it depends on what your experience and what your role is as to whether the PMP would be appropriate. Um, but I would say PRINCE2 would always be, in my opinion, the starting point because it gives you that fantastic structure and then maybe decide whether to do the PMP after that. Yeah. Are we okay for time, Gemma, for the other question? Yeah, okay. Good. Yeah. Um, okay, next one is asking that I'm referring to project manager throughout. Does it apply program managers too? Now, really interesting question. PRINCE2 is very much project management methodology yeah uh, projects in a controlled environment that's what PRINCE stands for now axelos who owns PRINCE2 uh, people cert and axelos um also have another qualification called msp managing successful programs and that's kind of like the brother and sister to PRINCE2 so if you are a program manager then having an understanding of PRINCE2 would be really helpful because of the connection with the program but the uh, MSP, the Managing Successful Program, is specifically focused for programs and program managers. So, yeah, PRINCE2 is focused purely on managing projects, not programs. It connects to programs, it mentions what programs are, and because programs can be the management level above, but yeah, there's the other qualification there as well. Okay. Um, would PRINCE2 help with projects run in Agile? Now, interesting concept this because one of the things um, in PRINCE2 is it does talk about different delivery methods. So it talks about a linear and iterative agile ways of working. And all the way through PRINCE2, it explains how in different contexts, different environments, there's different types of delivery methods. Um, so yes, it will help with the structure and it links into agile ways of working. Yeah. Um, how many years will version seven remain relevant? Hmm. Now then, crystal ball. Okay. Now I've been involved with Prince Two since um, I did my first learning in 2007. I became a trainer in 2008, um, and since then there's been a, a number of versions. There was a big jump um, for for quite a few years at one, but the previous version came out on the 10th of July 2017. That's when version six came out, and then this version came out on the 4th of September this year. So that's been like, um, what, six years that version six was around. Now, I have absolutely no idea to be able to answer that. All I can do is reflect previously, there's been three, four, five, six years between the different versions. Um, I was uh, involved uh, with people sent on doing the updates with Prince too, um, but I am not privy to any sort of knowledge like that, okay. Um, 
oh, back to the charter question, I think it is. Referring uh, the business case that is required to justify project needs, can you explain what is the difference between project charter and business case documents? They are mandatory or one of them is sufficient. Now, in Prince 2, they don't use this terminology of a project charter as such. They purely use the terminology of business case to justify the project. So, um, I, as far as I am aware, it's, I'm not an expert in every possible term there is in the world for project management. That's something I've not personally come across before. In, so, in which case, business case is what Prince 2 um, focuses on. Okay. Um, Okay, so question between Prince2 versus Prince2 Agile. Um, so there is a crossover clearly between Prince2 and Prince2 Agile. Um, and um, there is going to be some updates um, to link into Prince2 7 because Prince2 Agile is currently based around the version 6 Prince2. Um, so there is a crossover um, between them. Um, so, but it's, it's still there's a lot of differences with Prince2 Agile as well. Um, I think oh. that's all. There are a couple of questions that um, I'll ask one of our salespeople to get back to you okay. on. So there's a couple of individuals I think would be beneficial for them to have a direct conversation. And um, one other question was about the what's changed Prince2 webinar. That's on our YouTube channel, so you can watch it now. Um, Oh, and I think that oh, one's quickly popped in. So I'll, I'll just share this with you, Karen. <laughs> it's okay. That's all right. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think it's like that continued question okay. around. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so the what that that looks like is is more around like the PID within in in print two because the print the PID includes the scope requirements it includes the business case it includes what you've mentioned there about your rage your risks assumptions and, and uh, dependencies issues all of that will be documented as part of the PID to a certain degree the procedural side of things anyway um but um so it will be included within there but slight, under slightly different headings probably yeah okay now i think we've kind of naturally come to the to the end of the questions there so i'd like to to wrap up i'm going to hand back over to Gemma, but i'd just like to personally say thank you for listening and to me uh, waffling on about friends too for a while um and uh, maybe i'll see you again in the future on some of the courses all right so thank you from me over to Gemma. that's brilliant and thanks karen it's really good really informative and as said you'll get a copy of the recording tomorrow but also it'll be available on our youtube channel and we will be sending out a social post just with a link to the recording as well next week. So if you're on our social, you can get also see that there as well. So brilliant. Thanks, Karen. And have a good day, rest of you, and lovely weekend as well. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.